So thank you everybody uh, for coming. We are uh, incredibly excited to be here in Miami with you uh, for Bitcoin 2021. Uh, we're especially thankful to Bitcoin Magazine and the organizers uh, of this great event for inviting two boys from Austin, Texas, uh, the true Bitcoin capital of the world, uh, uh, to kick off the Stacking Stats stage for you guys today and to really set the tone. Yeah. Um, and we're actually going to be talking about this stack and we're kind of got it laid out here for you. We're not even the only people talking about this today on this stage. If you hang out and wait a couple hours, you'll hear from Wiz, uh, from BISC and a few other projects about his visions for the same kind of stack that we're describing today. But let's get started and talk about why we're actually, uh, or who we are and introduce ourselves a bit. Uh, so for those of you that don't know me, I'm Ryan Gentry. I'm the director of business development at Lightning Labs. Uh, Lightning Labs is building uh, the Lightning Network and we're on a mission to bring Bitcoin to the next billion people. Uh, prior to my job at Lightning Labs, I worked for a crypto hedge fund and got pitched many, many, many projects with, with you know, worthless tokens. And I'm, I was sick of hearing the excuse, well, you know, we need to launch a token because we can't build this on Bitcoin. Uh, and so a large part of the motivating factor of this talk is to show, no, actually, you can be build this thing on Bitcoin, and it's actually will be much better if you do. So I work on layer one at Unchained Capital. I'm Drew Fansel. Um, but I also speculate frequently about Bitcoin thousands of years from now into the future. Um, I feel comfortable making those kinds of speculations because I see a path from layer one where we are right now through the stack that we're building towards uh, to those crazy speculations of mine in the future. Uh, so I want to talk about that with all of you today. But before we get into any of it, we should talk about why we're all here right now in Miami. And we're here because we all believe Bitcoin has already won, right? Bitcoin is, is already on its path to be the global reserve currency of the future. Uh, the last 12 years of laser focus in the Bitcoin developer community uh, on censorship resistance, on protecting the 21 million cap, on, on decentralization was absolutely the right call. Uh, and we see the obvious evidence of that now. Uh, as central banks are talking about Bitcoin in a serious way, macro hedge funds are talking about Bitcoin as inflation hedge, right? And, and most importantly, we have, you know, companies like Mass Mutual Insurance holding uh, Bitcoin on their balance sheet. And as, because this is going to be a little bit of a controversial talk, this still holds true, even if ETH is to briefly flip BTC, right? Uh, it won't happen. But. It won't happen. But even if that holds true, the, the properties that we've built into Bitcoin over the last 12 years are, are strong and, and will continue to be strong. And, you know... Of ETH, I think even shitcoiners, frankly, know that Bitcoin has already won. And you kind of know this just by looking at the distribution of who owns what. Uh, there are a lot of people who only own Bitcoin. There's very few people who only own Ethereum and don't own Bitcoin or only own some other kind of altcoin. So even they know that Bitcoin has already won. So then why do they persist? Why like, do they keep building altcoins, new projects, new ICOs, tokens, all sorts of other stuff? Is it really because they're stupid? or they're scammers? Is that really the answer? Um, maybe, maybe for some percentage of them, that's actually what's happening. But it's Ryan and I's belief that for a lot of folks, Hello? Okay, it's Ryan and I's belief that for a lot of folks uh, in altcoin land, they think they're building projects, they think they're solving problems that Bitcoin can't solve. That's what they think is happening. Um, and I want to walk you through a little bit of an analogy to like a way to perceive this, this split in the narrative. So uh, this is Silicon Valley, the show, <clears throat> not Silicon Valley, the investment community, but I think what we're saying applies just as well to that community. Um, there's a character on Silicon Valley known as Guilfoyle, pictured here. Um, Guilfoyle is uh, it's not a character you're meant to like. Um, he's kind of a know-it-all, he's an anarchist, and he's kind of a dick, uh, and it turns out he's a Bitcoin supporter, and there's some good scenes in the show where, you know, he's talking about Bitcoin and owning it and what he does with it. And um, the show portrays Bitcoin as something that, you know, it exists. It's a thing. It's not going away, probably. Uh, but it's not really the interesting thing. It's not what the characters in the show focus on. Instead, there's this other scene that I think is really important uh, in which you have the main character here, Richard, who's talking to an investor of his. Uh, and the investor is asking him, hey man, what would you build, you know, if you could build anything? If you know this scene, that's, so those aren't exactly the words that this investor uses. Um, but the response that Richard gives is, I want to build a new internet. And the way, like in this scene, there's like music like swelling behind him, you know, there's like cellos and strings. And you're really supposed to believe in this. You're supposed to believe that Richard is right, that his project of a new, open, distributed, fairer internet is a good project. Um, and so this contrast between the narrative of Bitcoin as like this weird, strange money that people like Guilfoyle like and 
uh, altcoins. Uh, of course, I should have mentioned this. Obviously, Richard builds his new internet on uh, you know a new crypto coin that his company makes. So contrasting Guilfoyle and Bitcoin with Richard and Ethereum and altcoins, this is kind of a split that is is evident in Silicon Valley to show, but just as much in the investment community as well. And just like Drew was saying, Silicon Valley, the show, portrays this narrative, the, these two narratives, uh, kind of the boring sound money thing with, with anarchists and the exciting better internet, right? Uh, the same narratives hold true in, in real life, right? Uh, Silicon Valley, the investment community in Silicon Valley, the developer community, right? We have uh, everybody here, uh, I believe, believes, you know, if we fix the money, we fix the world. The root problem, the, the big bad is central banks debasing the money. And if we can fix that and return to a sound money standard, all everything else will flow and and and, and naturally uh, the 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 decentralized and become more fair and more open, right? Uh, the Silicon Valley view uh, is is that they have a much more tangible problem, right? The the sound money problem is very intangible. It's tough for people to wrap their minds around. Uh, it requires going down the rabbit hole. It requires studying Austrian economics. The Silicon Valley problem. Uh, of centralized tech companies uh, ruining the world and degrading the internet over the last 10 years is much more tangible, right? People understand or, and have experienced fake news. People understand and have experienced uh, ad services and, and creepy popping up uh, and kind of scaring you with, are they listening to me, et cetera, et cetera, right? People understand, you know, now I have to pay $10 for 10 different streaming services when I used to get all of this stuff for free, right? Uh, it's a much more tangible narrative. And so there, there are those two that I think uh, the Silicon Valley community views as, as a real problem of the internet just because it's something that people intuitively understand. And, and it's a little frustrating because really these are the same problem, right? The, the decentralizing the money versus decentralizing the internet, these are both examples of a fundamental problem with centralized systems, right? They create misaligned incentives, they grow slowly, they, they enrich those in power and they screw over the rest of us. Fundamentally, they're also brittle. That's something that we're seeing very clearly over the last year and a half as we see centralized systems struggle to deal with the changes brought upon by a global pandemic. Now, the solution is distributed systems. Distributed systems are fairer. They create better outcomes. They don't coerce their participants, they incentivize them. This leads to fairer interactions and more robust systems that are capable of dealing with change better and growing more quickly. Uh, so it's the same problem, and we need to start treating it like it's the same problem and approaching it that way. And I think the core root thing that Bitcoin represents to me is Bitcoin is freedom money, right? Uh, and the left side of that panel, right, the Bitcoin narrative, is what is Bitcoin good for? It's for freeing us from central banks. It's for freeing us from fractional reserve banking, right? But what if that wasn't the only thing that Bitcoin could free us from? What if Bitcoin could also disrupt not only central banks, but telecommunications companies, big tech, uh, you know, energy, big, large energy companies, and build a more resilient grid, right? Wouldn't Bitcoin be more valuable if it not only was disrupting central banks, but it was also disrupting all of these other centralized intermediaries uh, that are part of our life? Bitcoin's already doing a great job of distributing the money uh, and disrupting central banks. What if it could do more? And, but before you answer that question, I think it's important to, to say out loud that, um, let me put it differently, a lot of times I think in Bitcoin audiences when people start talking about fixing the internet or other kinds of applications of Bitcoin, other problems it can solve, there's this like tension that these guys are about to pitch an ICO, aren't they? Um, and we're not going to do that, I promise. Like That's not our intention. In fact, I don't think that's the interesting part about Bitcoin. Uh, they, this idea of the blockchain and having to pull the blockchain out and using a new blockchain for a new token, this is cargo culting. This is not the main innovation that we need to recognize that Bitcoin makes. Instead, we believe that distribution is market driven. And the thing that we need to export from Bitcoin is its market. The idea that we can build an open distributed market that anybody can join. That's the part that we need to lift, not the blockchain. Now, as we think about layers that are going to come in the future, there's a lot of ways to break them down. We've made this little graphic. You can think about it along these dimensions. There, it's not that this is exactly what's going to happen. It's that the existence of layers of markets is really, really important. These separate layers uh, solve different problems. They have different requirements. And by building them as layers, we decouple them from each other. They also create demand pull. Layer two makes layer one more valuable. Layer three makes layer two and layer one more valuable. And so this is really the lesson that we want everybody to remember from this talk. And in the immortal words of the great philosopher Shrek, uh, Bitcoin is like an onion. It has layers, right? So this first part of the talk, uh, we've, we've kept it very high level talking about narratives and, and things like that. Uh, the second part of the talk is going to be pretty technical. Uh, so if you happen to fall asleep in the next 10 to 15 minutes, I hope you remember this one thing. Uh, it's that everything 
that Altcorners dream of, all the world computer, all the distributed markets for storage, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We can all build that on top of Bitcoin with Bitcoin as the base settlement layer. It will just happen in a layered approach and it will take time, right? And so, uh, but we're encouraging you to buy into this narrative, uh, to believe that Bitcoin can solve these problems and that there is a large contingent of people who would be much more interested in Bitcoin if they believe that Bitcoin could be used to solve these problems and disremediate these people. Okay, so let's get into it a little bit more level of detail. So I want to start with layer one or market number one, which is Bitcoin and the blockchain and transactions. So I've got a little graphic here. How does Bitcoin work? Right on the top left, you've got users. On the top right, there's miners. In the middle is the mempool. Users put transactions into the mempool. Miners pull transactions out, put them into blocks. That requires proof of work. Those blocks join the blockchain. There's difficulty adjustment, which ensures that those blocks are a certain level of difficulty. Okay, so that's basically how it works. This is a giant market, right? Like users, when they're putting transactions into the mempool, those are bids for having those transactions be settled with a particular fee. That's why we sort of color coded those transactions in the mempool. Similarly, miners, when they're pulling transactions out and put them into blocks, those are like there's a minimum fee that they're going to include. That's kind of their ask for being included into settlement for that block. Similarly, when miners are producing blocks, the process of hashing can be thought of as bidding to win the block that's going to get added to the blockchain. And similarly, like the process of difficulty readjustment can be thought of users ask for security. That's what the difficulty is. Um, it's what the user side of the market wants. So these are two coupled markets for transaction settlement and transaction security. Like, but let's make it really explicit. Let's use the language of markets to describe what's happening here. So the mempool is an order book. It turns out it's a really tiny order book. It's very small in terms of absolute data size, which is a point we'll come back to, but it's an order book. Um, the process of getting those orders filled is the consensus rules of Bitcoin. When you put a transaction into the mempool, you don't get to choose which block it goes into. That process is done automatically through the consensus rules. That's what it means for Bitcoin to match orders. And those orders, when they're matched, they land in the blockchain, which is a ledger of completed orders. In fact, the difficulty rebalancing algorithm can be thought of as a process of market making. Every two weeks or 2016 blocks, the user side of the market reacts to the changes in supply of hash rate and sets a new price, if you'd like, in terms of difficulty. So all these ideas are really markets and how they work. The, the important thing to recognize is it's not the blockchain which is making all of this work. It's the idea that every aspect of this market is distributed. The order pool is distributed, order matching is distributed, and market making is distributed. Like this is very, very powerful, and Bitcoin is the first thing to ever work this way. This is the part of Bitcoin we need to export to other layers. And so it's really important as, as I move to market number two, uh, layer two, the Lightning Network, uh, that we now, it's taken us you know, 11 years and change to really understand well uh, the market that's happening at layer one, and to have it be solid, to have it work well, uh, and to have it be uncorruptible. Uh, we're only three years into uh, the Lightning Network itself, which I'll explain uh, here for those that are unaware. So our understanding of how this market works is a little bit more fuzzy, uh, but we believe we can apply all of the same principles uh, to make sure that the Lightning Network is a truly distributed, fair marketplace uh, for Bitcoin transactions. Uh, and so the Lightning Network is, is made up, uh, the core primitive is a payment channel. So we have a little uh, illustration here. Uh, a payment channel is uh, when Dhruv and I uh, each have uh, some Bitcoin. If I want to open up a channel to him, uh, all of a sudden we can send a bunch of transactions back and forth off chain uh, instead of having to pay the miners for every single transaction, right? And this is really powerful uh, for, for cheaper and faster settlement uh, of transactions. Uh, the network part of the Lightning Network uh, is chaining a bunch of those payment channels together. Uh, and so when we talk about liquidity, like how money flows in these payment channels, it's kind of like liquid in a pipe, right? Like roast beef, our, our CTO uh, calls them money tubes because it's really just, you know, uh, liquidity flowing back and forth between these. When you chain multiple payment channels together, all of a sudden, you know, I can send through Drew to you in the audience to somebody else uh, without ever having to chop, uh, touch the blockchain, uh, without ever having to trust any inter intermediary, right? And so this network aspect uh, is then really powerful and brings the concept of the Lightning Network of routes. Uh, and so the graphic we have here with the network, imagine, uh, you know, the red is a possible path for yellow to send to purple, uh, and the green is the actual cheapest, best path, the route uh, from yellow to purple. Right now, we're still in like the very early days of this marketplace for routing, uh, where 
just like the early internet, uh, every single node has to keep a list of every single other node that's on the Lightning Network, right? In the early days of the internet, there was no such thing as DNS lookups. Uh, there was no such thing as you know distributed uh, routing tables, right? It was it was all everybody had the same log file uh, of all the uh, of all the nodes on the network. We're still in that same stage for the Lightning Network, but in the future, you can imagine using the same principles we've learned from Layer One on Bitcoin, uh, a marketplace uh, popping up for routing, where you could simply put in a bid uh, for a route that would fulfill your payment and there would be somebody on the other side that would happily fulfill it for you, right? And so this layer two market as we're, uh, for liquidity and for routes that we're starting to see develop, uh, you have users and businesses who will be bidding and routing nodes who will have asks uh, for providing liquidity and providing routes, right? And so we're, again, like we're at this very early stage of this marketplace, but I think it's really important right now to you know, jump out of theory and into practice and give you two examples of companies that are building uh, exactly in this marketplace. Yeah, and we're going to walk, Ryan's going to walk you through these examples, but I think just looking at the time, I think we should move fast through these. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk at roast beef speed. Um, so Sphinx Chat, uh, hopefully you guys are familiar, uh, is an application uh, that runs uh, on the Lightning Network. Uh, and so what's really cool about applications on the Lightning Network is each application is a subnet uh, on top of the broader Lightning Network. You can see I've identified you know, a handful of blue nodes here. Those are the nodes that are running the Sphinx Relay database, right? Not every node has to run this database. So there is an overlay on top of the Lightning Network itself that is the Sphinx application, the Sphinx network. Uh, by building on the Lightning Network, uh, Sphinx developers get identity uh, as your pub key. They get onion routing, they get payments, and they get the ability to send data end-to-end -end encrypted between each other. Um, this is not yet 100% distributed like Bitcoin, but this is a messaging app that is way more distributed than Telegram, Signal, et cetera, et cetera, because all of the nodes collectively are the server instead of there being a central server that has all of the messages. And again, like with the theme of order books, uh, all requests uh, to send and receive messages between users, those are the bids and the asks uh, in the Sphinx network marketplace. Right. There's, this is another project we wanted to talk about. I think we should skip it and just kind of push forward. Okay. Uh, Impervious is the same sort of thing where it's a subnet that's sitting on top of the layer two graph. Same sort of idea, right? You have asks for uh, uh, forwarding data and you have bids for users that want to leverage the subnet and the services they provide. So similar level services. Um, so what we really want to focus on with these two examples or one and a half examples uh, because of time is we sometimes present the Lightning Network like it's for payments. And that's definitely true, it is for payments, but I think it's just as much a, a network for data transmission. This is a rough just table that shows how long various data networks took to get built and usable, how long they took to reach a certain number of users. Like telephones took more than a century to reach a significant fraction of the Earth's population. Uh, the internet did it in about 20 years because it could build off the telecom um, networks. Uh, Tor, which is trying to be a more private, better version of the internet, interestingly never, even though it got started in 2002 pre-Bitcoin, has never made it past 10 million active users as far as uh, we can find. Um, contrast that with Bitcoin, which is growing faster than the internet and is about to reach 100 million users uh, by some definition this year. Um, the Lightning Network is growing even faster than Bitcoin. And it's important to remember that internally, the Lightning Network is using Tor. It is an onion routed network. And so we're a year away from the Lightning Network being the largest onion network in existence. And why is that true? It's because you're incentivized to run Lightning nodes. This is a huge difference in Tor. You run a Tor node, you take risk, and there's no reward. So people don't do it. If you run a Lightning node, you can get paid for routing. This is the idea of the marketplace. If you make the market open, people will join the market and it will grow quickly. And to be clear, if a bunch of exchanges, like when a bunch of exchanges onboard Lightning, um, their user base is now on Lightning. That gives you maybe 100 million people on Lightning. That is bigger than the internet in the 90s. So we shouldn't think of Lightning as just for payments. It should be thought of as just as much a network for data. And that's where it gets really exciting because now you start to ask what is the killer app for the Lightning network? Now, again, fast, cheap payments with better privacy. This is really important and I don't want to diminish that aspect of the Lightning network. Like that makes Bitcoin better. But just as much, it could be the case that if applications like Sphinx, Imper Sphinx Impervious, and many others, like it could be that there are things that you can only buy on the Lightning Network because that's the only place they're sold. Now that becomes an interesting reason to spend your sats over and above just wanting to get rid of them. Um, finally, just rounding out our ideas about order books, this is the hardest problem in distributed systems, right? Bitcoin gets kind of, get, I'm gonna go through this real fast, unfortunately, because we're only got a couple minutes left. Bitcoin uh, gets through this kind of fast because its mempool is tiny. 
Um, it, the transactions don't change frequently, and there's a block subsidy to incentivize users to get on the network and start mining transactions. Uh, that's Bitcoin scale. The next level is, is Visa scale. That's a much bigger order of book that the Lightning Network has to deal with, which makes it more challenging. And finally, if you really want to get to these higher layers, that's web scale. That's every network request. That's every data I.O. and computation that's occurring on the web. Like, that's a huge order book. How do we manage that? There's one kind of like paradigmatic approach that we always take, which is you start with every participant has their own copy of the order book. That's what Bitcoin's mempool is when you run your node. And Lightning has the same thing when you run an L and, uh, a Lightning node. Uh, the second step is to incentivize greater consensus amongst different order books by pooling. That's what a mining pool is. When you join a mining pool, you're giving up your mempool and you're using the pool of the mining pool orchestrator, which is, of course, step three, is to distribute the orchestration itself. And you're seeing things like Better Hash, now known as Stratum V2, are examples of that. That is not happening yet in the Lightning Network just because it's newer, but that's the direction it's going to go in. And this is the kind of solution that we should expect to see for order books at arbitrary scales. So finally, if you remember only one thing, like let me say it again, Donkey, like Bitcoin is in layers. And we have one minute left, so let's try to go through this real fast. So importantly, as we've walked you through these layers from the bottom up, uh, it's, it's, it's important to realize ETH is doing this backwards, right? They started off with the world computer, then they realized, oh, we need infrastructure, that's Web3. Oh, we need payments, now we need DeFi. Oh, actually, people only want to be paid in sound money, now we need ETH's money, right? We're going through this same progression, but we're doing it the right way, building it from the ground up, and we're, we're just getting into kind of the Web3 status, which is really exciting. And I think the, the motivating factor here, the call to action, is by building in this layered approach and buying into this narrative that actually Bitcoin can disrupt many of these centralized intermediaries. It gives the 21 million cap, the censorship store of store value, defense in depth. Uh, healthy layer two improves layer one. A better internet protects Bitcoin and useful applications for everyday users makes the idea of banning Bitcoin ridiculous, even though it already is ridiculous. And so to conclude, Bitcoin is going to distribute everything. Now, if you're a Bitcoiner and you want to get rid of ETH, you want it to go to zero, you want altcoins to go away, uh, don't make fun of them. Educate them. Like, teach them that we can do what they want in a better, more scalable, more robust fashion. We don't want to lose a generation of developers to other tokens. And if you're on the Ethereum side of this, you're someone that maybe thinks about moving your project to Tron or whatever the other altcoins are even called, I don't even know. Like, if you're willing to do that, maybe consider moving your project to Bitcoin. Like, that's going to happen one day, and it's the only way to save things long term. So that's it. That's it. Thank you very much for coming.